We left off with, uh, with this slide where we took a bit of a detour and looked at different kinds of transport. Different kinds of transport because we'll start to refer to them by name uh, in the absorption section now and then when we get to kidney function in the next set of slides. Which we might even be able to get started today, but that depends on how quickly we get through this uh, information. So, movement across the membrane, sometimes it's easy. Sometimes just diffusion works. Passive movement of a molecule across the membrane. Not everything can do that. Not everything can move across the membrane. Some things need to uh, be facilitated. So facilitated diffusion was movement across the membrane, but if there was a pore or a channel available. It's like diffusion, but there's an opening or primary active transport, the one that needed energy. Something is pumped across the membrane. Remember, secondary active transport is different from that one. It requires something to help move the molecule, but it's not energy specifically. Usually with secondary active transport, movement of the first molecule is linked to movement of a second molecule down its concentration gradient, either in the same direction or in the opposite direction. And then there were some interesting ideas about um, vesicular transport, endocytosis, and exocytosis. We'll see an example of that quickly today. So uh, the first question, I'm just going to ask you a quick question about review on this slide or this, this video. Review on information that I just went over in the past two minutes. So having watched this video and having had your memory refreshed and not watching it again, which is movement of a molecule through a pore or a channel? Movement of a molecule through a pore or a channel. through a pore or a channel. One of the easier ones. Still 30 seconds, so lots of time. Get your answer in. Fantastic. Look at that. Everyone with facilitated diffusion. Coming in hot. Nice job. Which one? Follow up slightly harder. Which one is movement of a molecule with the concentration gradient of another molecule? with the concentration of another molecule. I didn't say this specifically in that little recap. Maybe you caught it. Or maybe it just makes sense looking at the, the words or the options that are here. Movement of a molecule with the concentration gradient. Okay, okay, a little bit of a dispersion in the results. Primary active transport was the most popular answer, and that was the one that needed ATP. That's energy uh, being required to pump an item specifically. That's not the right answer. We need energy in some way, shape, or form, but it's not from the breakdown of ATP when we move with the concentration gradient of another molecule. That is SIMPORT, secondary active transport. Maybe I should have said SIMPORT in that little brief recap. But it makes sense. They're, they're going in tandem. They're in sync. Uh, in sync. They're synchronized. They're moving in the same direction. Antiport would be the opposite, moving in the opposite direction of another molecule. And diffusion. You know, I can actually see an argument for diffusion if I hadn't included this word another. Then what I would be describing would not be too different from diffusion. Movement of a molecule with the concentration gradient of that molecule would be diffusion. It's an interesting uh, take on that question. Maybe what I'll do is I'll just uh, not include this one in the results because there's a bit of controversy after having reviewed it a little bit. 
You guys have opened my eyes to it. That's all I want to do for review. So let's move on. Absorption in the small intestine. There will be more questions coming up. Don't worry. Keep your phones open and on you. Or keep your, your uh, web browsers open. There's like four or five more questions. So absorption in the small intestine, we covered this slide. This was the breakdown of carbohydrates. Largely there are little pieces left over, polysaccharides, that are broken down by brush border enzymes in the small intestine. And these small pieces, if they're longer small pieces, four plus saccharides in a row, alpha dextrinase will break these down. But more commonly, we'll see di uh, not that, that's disaccharides in solution, like you see with uh, common table sugar, which is sucrose, maltose, which is two glucoses, and lactose, a different kind of, uh, of disaccharide. Each of these has their very own brush border enzymes. Alpha dextrinase will break down the longer chains, cleaving one at a time from the end and then shortening it. Each of these has their very own brush border enzyme that will break the disaccharide, releasing the individual carbohydrate unit, the monosaccharide, and those are absorbed pretty easily. Notice facilitated diffusion. Fructose moves through a pore or a channel in the membrane with the concentration gradient passive. Glucose and galactose move with the sodium concentration gradient. So these are secondary active transport, or simple. The second example that we talked about today. So I'm going to ask you a question about this. Open up your phones. And bring your web browsers back out. I didn't put the little icon in the top right, so I'm telling you. Which brush border enzyme breaks down lactose? This is a really hard one. Even if you weren't paying attention, even if you weren't here on Tuesday, just by process of elimination, you could probably guess the correct answer. For questions like these, 30 seconds, far too long. I'm leaving 30 seconds, though, for any connection issues that you might have. Alpha dextrinase, absolutely. No, no, lactase, of course. Lactase breaks down lactose. Good. Incidentally, if you are having trouble connecting, if it says that you can't connect to the poll, if you can't submit answers, take a screenshot of it showing the error and let me know. Break it down and show me afterwards if you try to troubleshoot and see if you can connect afterwards. I want to make sure everyone can answer the questions. But show me what's going on. Don't just say afterwards that something happened. Okay. Carbohydrates, pretty straightforward. Break them down into smaller and smaller units. Monosaccharides are mostly just, um, they mostly just diffuse across the membrane. Peptides, a little bit different. Proteins. Now we know protein digestion starts in the stomach with pepsin. You saw that in lab. And then a whole host of other protein degrading enzymes are released in the pancreatic juice. Trypsin, chymotrypsin, uh, carboxypeptidase, elastase, all different forms of the same kind of enzyme. The difference is each enzyme is specific. It, it, it breaks the bond between two different amino acids. It's specific to the bond between two amino acids. So you might have a protein that looks like this. Each of these little circles is an amino acid. And maybe one of the enzymes is really good at cleaving the bond between the two light blue circles. And so it will do that for all of the polypeptides that are available. Maybe one enzyme is really good at breaking the bond between the red and the purple circles. It will do that for all the polypeptides that are available. But the enzymes don't do a good job of breaking multiple bonds. They're usually specific to one or two different parents. That's why we have so many of them. So a lot of the protein digestion starts in the stomach and will continue through the uh, small intestine with the pancreatic enzymes. But we might end up 
with little polypeptides like this, few amino acids long. If we have simple proteins, like are outlined on the slide, one, two, maybe three amino acids, they can be transported, but anything longer needs to be broken down. Brush border enzymes, again, for the win. There are two major brush border enzymes. One is amino peptidase. And you'll learn in biochemistry there are two ends of a polypeptide, the amino end and the carboxy end, the N-terminal and the C-terminal. This is just like alpha dextrinase on the last slide. This will cleave off amino acids one at a time from the end of a polypeptide. It happens to cleave them off of the amino end of the polypeptide, hence amino peptidase. So we can deal with most of the longer polypeptides in, in this fashion. But sometimes we'll have smaller polypeptides, and even in the case where we have di or tripeptides, we want to get the individual amino acids released to be absorbed. Both of these notice through secondary active transport. So dipeptidase is a non-specific <laughs> enzyme that breaks down almost any dipeptides. Dipeptidase breaks down dipeptides, almost any configuration of dipeptides. So we have blue and blue, light blue and dark blue, dark blue and red. Dipeptidase breaks them all down so the amino acids can be absorbed through the same mechanisms. Facilitated diffusion. Nope. Secondary active transport. Good thing you caught me. Both of these are symport mechanisms, one with uh, sodium and one with protons. So let me ask you another question real quickly. Having paid attention to everything on this slide and having your phones out and your web browsers available, what are the two brush border enzymes that digest protein in the small intestine? Brush border enzymes. There are other protein degrading enzymes on this list, but they're not necessarily brush border enzymes. Now you should be able to pick more than one. And you can only pick two, which is good. So pick two. What two brush border enzymes digest protein in the small intestine? Good stuff. Large majority got amino peptidase correct and dipeptidase correct. It's fresh in your memories. Trypsin is a protein degrading enzyme. Pepsin, of course. Carboxypeptidase, I mentioned that. It's the, it's the, uh, the evil twin of amino peptidase. Good. What's left? Carbohydrates, proteins, fats are left. And fats are where it gets really interesting. It's not typical digestion on the fat side of things. Now, most fat digestion occurs with pancreatic lipase in the small intestine. So this is released from the pancreas with bile in the duodenum, <coughs> mixes with the chyme as it passes through the small intestine, all the while trying to emulsify and break down fat. What do we mean by fat? What do we mean by fat? You might be picturing like olive oil. Not unreasonable. Or the edge of a nice steak. Not unreasonable. Fat. What do we mean by fat at this level? The most common form of fat in the body is in triglycerides. And triglycerides simply describes three tri fats attached to a glycerol backbone. Glycerides. And this is the large majority of the form of fat as it comes into the body. And I've purposefully drawn it a little askew because the red ovals here are the individual chains, the individual fatty acids themselves. And this is a really interesting area when you um, get into nutrition and uh, start to consider how food, how you are what you eat, so to speak. It's really most obvious on the fat side of things. 
So the individual fats can be many shapes and sizes. They can be saturated, they can be unsaturated, they can be short, they can be long, they can be hydrogenated. You've heard about these things before in foods that you've eaten. And it just means they're a different shape fat attached to that same puppet backbone, that same glycerol backbone. So we want to break these down because we need to make use of these fatty acids. This is, these are what all the membranes in our cells are made out of, these fatty acids. So one of these little red ovals will be digested and then incorporated into the cells of your body. You literally are what you eat. These make up the cells of your body. And without going on a rant, the types of uh, membrane changes the, the uh, function of, of enzymes and proteins in the membrane. Saturated is doing bad. It doesn't make the enzymes work. Omega-3 is really good. Much more fluid membranes, but I digress. So we have these incoming triglycerides. And we have our helpful enzyme, pancreatic lipase, that's going to do the job of breaking these up into usable pieces. And it cleaves individual fatty acids off of the triglyceride or off the glycerol backbone one at a time. So we're left with one fatty acid and a diglyceride now. You can guess where we're going next. A, a second fatty acid with a monoglyceride left over. If the fatty acid is of the right composition it can just move across. So we're, we're left with having to deal with these individual components in the intestine. Some fatty acids, some monoglycerides. The smallest fatty acids can just diffuse across. The smallest fatty acids really don't like being in a watery environment. And you know what's not watery? membrane of these cells. It just jumps right in, it can move straight through, and diffuse across the brush border through the microvilli into the circulation. So the small fatty acids, and we're calling them small chain fatty acids, because even though they're shaped like ovals here, they're long carbon chains that zigzag back and forth, the short chains diffuse right across with absolutely no problems. And at this level, I think it's worth mentioning, we've got, ready for transport, monosaccharides, amino acids, short chain fatty acids. All of these things have easily transported across the membranes of these microvilli. And these will enter the capillaries, enter the blood, and be delivered to the liver. All of these things at this point enter the blood right away and are delivered to the liver. And the liver will process them if it needs to. It'll take them out of the circulation if it has to. It'll repackage them and send them on their way. But we're left with a few things that are undigested and unabsorbed. Longer chain fatty acids and monoglycerides. And I'm not going to try to replicate or do what the, uh, the schematic here shows, but these are packaged into individual little bubbles called micelles. In the intestine, these things clump together in micelles, and the micelles are, uh, the micelles deliver the contents into the epithelial cells of the microvilli. This is an example of endocytosis. You saw that in the video. The contents of the micelle after it merges, the plasma membrane will open up and be released into the cell. Endocytosis. This is actually one of the places where um, they say a high fiber diet is good for you. Because a high fiber diet disrupts the formation of these micelles. So it actually disrupts some of the absorption of fat and a lot of it will just pass through your body. 
Well, once we have these harder to handle ingredients inside the cell, again, we're still limited. They can't just diffuse out. And so they're repackaged into these large lipoprotein complexes called chylomicrons. And a lipoprotein is simply a lipid and protein bundle. They're these really large, not very dense globs of fat with a few proteins sticking out of the surface. And they're really important because those are signals to cells in the body as the uh, chylomicron gets sent through the body. So the chylomicron is released, but it doesn't join the rest of the macronutrients in the blood. These are the things that are sent into the lymphatic system. They're absorbed by the lacteal in the villi. And they do eventually join the blood, but they take a roundabout route to get there. And we'll see that on the next slide. You see that on the second next slide. So I'm going to ask you a question about this quickly. You've all um, taken the time to, in settings, just prevent auto lock, right? So it stays on the whole time and you stay logged in. It might be an easy way than, or easier way than having to log in each time and then wait for it to load and open up the app. So on this topic, which were the fatty acids that are traditionally absorbed, that go into the blood? Is there more than one? I think it was monoglycerides, right? I don't know. Maybe I'm distracting you. Which type of fatty acids are absorbed traditionally into the blood through a capillary, just like uh, proteins and just like carbohydrates? Okay, so the, the majority wins out. Short chain fatty acids are the correct answer. The really small fatty acids just diffuse across. Triglycerides are the incoming form of fat. So that is the, probably the least digested, least processed form. And that needs to undergo processing in order to be in a usable form for the body. So triglycerides is the, the starting point. Those aren't absorbed at all. Traditionally, those are what are broken down by lipase in the small intestine. Monoglycerides, I can understand it sounds small, mono, singular, one glyceride, one fatty acid attached to a glycerol backbone, but it's still too bulky to get through on its own, unaided. Only the short chain fatty acids are absorbed traditionally. And so you, you can see that um, schematic outline here. The lacteal, or the lymphatic, um, uh, access to the lymphatic system in the middle through the lacteal and the capillary network bordering the lacteal, where we have diffusion of carbohydrates, diffusion or transport of amino acids, some diffusion of short chain fatty acids. You can see it highlighted right here, this little red circle. Short chain fatty acid in the blood. All of that being delivered to the liver first and foremost. Remember, it's processed in the sinusoids, drained through the central vein, through the hepatic vein, back to the inferior vena cava to the heart. Chylomicrons have a much more roundabout route, though. Consider how different this is. Proteins, carbohydrates, the liver gets them first. Which is good. We talked about blood glucose in the lab. You really want an adequate supply of glucose and of glycogen in the liver. The liver is responsible for maintaining blood glucose. We want first crack at the incoming glucose. Chylomicrons, so the larger fatty acids and monoglycerides, they travel all the way through the thoracic duct and then they enter the bloodstream at the left subclavian vein. They bypass the liver altogether. They, at the left subclavian vein, so up here, where the lymphatic system dumps back into the arterial, uh, arterial circulation. No, nope, that's wrong. Venous circulation. You caught me. 
So these chylomicrons aren't processed by the liver. They go right into the venous blood, right into the right atrium, through the heart, through the lungs, and are distributed on the arterial side to all of the body, to the muscle, to the adipose, to the liver. Every tissue in the body has an equal chance at breaking down and storing these chylomicrons. I got carried away. I didn't get these uh, animations up, but these are exactly what we've just, we've just been talking about. Carbohydrates, amino acids, short chain fatty acids delivered to the liver through the portal circulation. Everything else, which happens to just be longer chain fatty acids or monoglycerides, these are packaged into a lipoprotein form and they're eventually delivered to the liver, but they're also delivered to adipose, they're delivered to muscle, they travel through all of the arterial circulation before being absorbed into the tissues. And this is where having that lipoprotein shell really comes in handy because the, the proteins that are sticking out are the keys to the locks of the tissues. That is, the lipoprotein can only release those longer chain fatty acids into tissues that have the appropriate lock or the appropriate receptor. So they bind to adipose and they are taken up and stored in adipose. They can bind to liver, they're taken up and stored in liver. Some of them can bind to muscle. You can use fat in muscle for energy, but not as easily as you store it in adipose at all. What else do I want to mention? Um, one thing that you might be thinking about here is cholesterol, HDL, LDL, VLDL. Maybe you're not even thinking about it. But chylomicrons are a precursor to the classic cholesterol that you know in the body. So you've heard of HDL, high density lipoprotein as a good cholesterol. The liver makes that. It makes it out of chylomicrons. It makes it out of chylomicrons after they've been delivered to the liver through the arterial circulation. It'll make all the types of cholesterol out of chylomicrons after it receives them from the arterial circulation. What else do we need to mention here? We've got carbohydrate, proteins, fats. What we haven't talked about is uh, our electrolytes, minerals, water, and the like. We're just going to say that the large majority are absorbed in the small intestine without going into too much detail as we move on to the large intestine. We do leave 100, 150 mils of fluid in the lumen as the food moves through the small intestine to the large intestine to make that process, let's say, more comfortable. You wouldn't want to absorb all of the fluid out of the, uh, the lumen of the intestine, we create a solid mass that needs to be expelled from the body. We leave a little bit of fluid to maintain some semi-solid form of that material as it passes. So food in the large intestine, largely storage and expulsion of feces. That's the job of the large intestine. We have some vitamins that are synthesized here, some absorption of salts, but really there's not a lot of action going on in the small intestine, or sorry, in the large intestine. So at this point, chyme from the small intestine has mostly been reduced. Everything's been absorbed and the shriveled husk of the food that you once uh, ate avidly, whatever it was, turkey dinner, pizza, bag of Oreos, Shriveled husk is left over and the waste products are excreted or are to be excreted. So the chyme is mostly reduced, water is absorbed, but we, we leave a little bit to maintain a semi-solid mass. 
And here you can see the large intestine outline. There are four major parts. The cecum in the bottom right. The colon is the largest, most noticeable part that connects the cecum on the right to the rectum uh, inside the pelvis and then the distal tip of the rectum the anal canal or the anus so the four major parts of the large intestine we often just think about it as the colon being the large intestine but that's not entirely accurate so thinking of food coming into the large intestine from the small intestine it's again metered there's um, passage regulation ongoing. The ileocecal sphincter will uh, allow some food stuff through. Ileocecal sphincter is at the junction of the ileum and the cecum. Ileum being the last part of the small intestine and cecum being the first part of the large intestine. Now normally it's closed, it doesn't, or, or minimally open, so not a lot of food will pass through. But you know what relaxes the ileocecal sphincter? It's gastrin. We saw gastrin way back in the stomach. Remember it was released from um, G cells in the gastric pits. It helped to promote HCL production and the release of pepsin. It also travels all the way to this juncture of the small and large intestine and relaxes the ileocecal sphincter. Which makes sense. In the presence of a meal, there's new food stuff being jammed into the uh, digestive system, so you want to empty out whatever's ready. And so it relaxes the sphincter, allowing food to pass through. And so food passes in, and it fills up the ascending colon, the transverse colon, the descending colon, and you'll notice the, the bulgy segments called hostra. The hostra fill sequentially. And we'll talk about the actions of the hostra in a second. The hostra fill sequentially, moving food stuff through the large intestine, eventually to the rectum. Now, until it reaches the rectum, food's just stored. When it reaches a point of critical mass, when there is pressure and distension in the rectum, that's where we get the reflex to get rid of whatever is being stored. And by rectum, I mean this, this portion, this uh, vertical portion in the middle. It sits right anterior to the sacrum. It's bordered inferiorly by... Uh, two anal sphincters, which are meant to prevent unexpected release of the contents of the large intestine. Thank goodness. Two sphincters, one internal and one external. The internal is controlled involuntarily. So there are reflexes through the sacral spinal column, through the parasympathetic nervous system. We'll, we'll come back to that in two slides. But the external sphincter can be controlled voluntarily. You can clench the external anal sphincter if you need to. You can delay the emptying reflex if you need to, which is really good in some cases. So we have the, uh, the layout of the large intestine. How does food move through and how is it processed? That process of sequential filling of the hostra, singular it's a hostrum, but together these bulges are hostra, uh, is a result of hostral churning. So when there's pressure and distension in one of these pockets, it contracts. Squeezes the tube of toothpaste and the next segment fills up. And then when that one gets distended, it contracts. Fills the next segment, when it fills up, it contracts, so on and so forth. So we have this ongoing sequence of hostile churning that pushes food further and further through the large intestine. There's some peristalsis, but actually not a lot. It's just this individual segmented contraction that moves food through. 
Peristalsis itself doesn't happen at the same level as the esophagus or the small intestine, except for three or four rare situations during the day where we have this massive repositioning of the foodstuff in the large intestine. And this describes the mass peristalsis. This is also in relation to the release of gastrin. It usually happens with a meal. And that's it's the grumbling and rearrangement of stuff in the large intestine. You can hear it audibly a lot of the time. This mass peristalsis occurs across the length of the transverse colon and down the descending colon and it seats any of the contents distal in the rectum. It creates pressure later on in the large intestine, which is really important for that reflex, uh, for the release of reflex. The reflex of release, that's what I meant to say. Um, Right, so we have hostral churning that individually loads the, the individual hostra as they move through, and then with meals, this massive coordinated peristaltic contraction called mass peristalsis that moves everything to the end of the large intestine. And at this point, we're ready for it to be expelled, or at least the intestines are. Maybe we're not ready, but when we are ready, that uh, food stuff can be expelled in the, uh, the defecation reflex that we'll talk about next. But in the meantime, there's some other things that happen to food in the large intestine. There is some synthesis of um, some fat-soluble vitamins and B vitamins. There's a little bit of carbohydrate breakdown if there's any left over, but it's minimal. There is breakdown of some... Uh, leftover lactose. If there's any leftover lactose, the bacteria in the large intestine love to ferment and break that down. And that fermentation process is the same that would occur in the small intestine if you are lactose intolerant. There's a buildup of the products of fermentation, which are CO2 and methane gas and hydrogen gas. But it can't be absorbed as easily in the large intestine. If there's that buildup in the small intestine, it hurts, but the gas can be absorbed and disposed of. In the large intestine, it can't, and there's only one place for it to go, which is out. So fermentation is some leftover carbohydrates, some synthesis of vitamins. We'll squeeze out any last little bit of water that we can while maintaining that semi-solid mass. But really, there are drops in the bucket compared to the absorption and digestion in the small intestine. Largely, formation of feces is what we're here for. And then the defecation reflex, which is on the next slide. So storage, movement, seeding of that food stuff distally in the large intestine. And eventually, the expulsion. Let's talk about the expulsion. How do we know? How does the body know when food is ready and needs to be expelled? There are nervous sensors in the wall of the rectum that detect pressure, stretch, kind of like the baroreceptors. Or when we detect stretch in the hostia that contracts and pushes the food stuff uh, further into the large intestine. The rectal wall will send nervous impulses to the sacral spinal cord. It's right there, it's sitting right in front of the sacrum. So it's a small reflex arc that activates involuntary parasympathetic motor fibers. So stretch in the rectum creates this drive to contract and expel the contents from the large intestine. And that reflex doesn't just go back to the rectum, it goes to the entire large intestine. We want to contract the longitudinal muscles, so like sliding on the sleeve of your jacket. You can imagine what your hand is in this analogy. You want to contract 
the walls of the large intestine and increase pressure to expel whatever the contents are. The longitudinal muscles contract. If required, you can build up extra pressure with abdominal muscle contraction, contraction of the diaphragm, even some of the uh, thoracic muscles, the uh, intercostals can increase abdominal pressure. Usually this is enough though, the muscular reflex at the large intestine. So longitudinal, uh, longitudinal muscles contract the uh, large intestine, uh, the hostra contract, pressure builds, the internal sphincter relaxes, it opens so that the contents can be expelled, but you can override this if you need to. This is good for a situation like sitting in class. Maybe you've eaten not that long ago and you're trying to get rid of whatever food stuff you've, you've stored and, and digested. You can override it if you need to. Voluntary control over the external sphincter will allow you to override this natural involuntary mechanism for a time. Not indefinitely. So let me ask you a question about this series of, uh, of slides, or this reflex specifically. One last question, we'll call it for the day. One last question, and maybe we should uh, summarize quickly. So what initiates the defecation reflex? What's the first signal that you need to expel those contents from the body. What's the physical signal that causes you to want to contract and expel contents in the large intestine? Okay, majority wins. Distension in the rectum is correct. The stretch of the rectum is what initiates these cascades of signals. Stretch in the rectum will send that reflex to initiate parasympathetic activation. Stretch in the rectum will cause the internal anal sphincter to relax. But it's the stretch that is the first signal that initiates the defecation reflex. Let's hurry up and summarize. We've got two minutes. I covered a lot of information in this section. Looking back, making the summary slide, there's a lot of detail. This system deals with mechanical and chemical digestion of food. So breakdown of the physical form of food mechanically and breakdown of the, uh, the chemical form of food enzymatically. A lot of the success of the enzymatic or chemical breakdown is due to the secretion of uh, substances within the digestive system. Saliva, gastric juice, pancreatic juice. It mixes, it coats, it suspends, it emulsifies that foodstuff. It brings enzymes into contact with that foodstuff. We really skipped over a lot of the, uh, the proximal digestive system. We talked a little bit about the esophagus, but the stomach was our first major stopping point. It makes the acidic kind and starts to digest proteins, but mostly it stores food. Remember, it meters release into the small intestine. It doesn't all flow through at once. When it does flow through, that acidic juice, the acidic kind, is neutralized thanks to the alkaline pancreatic juice, and then fat is suspended thanks to bile. Now we have this mixture, still kind, that is in close contact with many digestive enzymes. This is where we get the large majority of enzymes to break down um, our individual macromolecules or macronutrients. Today we talked at length about absorption in the small intestine, so I won't go over that in too much detail, but the small intestine is where absorption happens. Um, way back when, last week, we talked about the hepatic sinusoids as the major site of absorption and processing of most nutrients. Here we see today it's 
uh, monosaccharides, amino acids, short chain fatty acids, but the large chain and the monoglycerides don't immediately go to the liver. They can still make their way around through the hepatic artery, but they're not delivered immediately to the liver. We just talked about the large intestine and defecation, so I won't summarize that. It's beating a dead horse. Have a wonderful Thursday. We'll see you tomorrow for uh, renal anatomy and physiology.